Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into truth, to glorify Jesus Christ as risen from the dead. Father, we just thank you so much for sending your son, that this living word is living and active inside of every one of us, and we can read your word. We can know you better through this word. So Father, let my lips be pleasing to you, our hearts be magnifying you and your name, and that we can uh, learn more about you and who you are through this precious word and as we study the book of Acts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're uh, going through the book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles, open up with me to Acts chapter 19. That's where we left off last time we spoke. And, um, and here we've been learning about Paul's stay in Ephesus. Uh, Acts 19 is all about Paul actually staying in Ephesus. And we know that um, as we're studying this, that he's been in Ephesus uh, for three years. He stays in Ephesus on his third missionary journey for three years. And, and here in Acts chapter 19, we're seeing some really neat things as, um, as Luke is describing his stay in Ephesus. And so here's that map. And if you, so if you remember, whenever he started on his third missionary journey, he started in Antioch, started in the summer of 54 AD, and he traveled through, you know, edifying the churches in Galatia. But remember, he's making a beeline to Ephesus because in Ephesus, he wants to get back. There's an open door in Ephesus and he discovered that or God opened that door on a second missionary journey, um, but he couldn't stay long because he told him, I, I need to get back to the feast, at, back to Jerusalem for the feast. So yet uh, a few months later, after he comes back to Antioch, only spends a few months in Antioch and now he's back in Ephesus because there's this great open door door. As soon as he starts in Ephesus, he starts uh, preaching. He goes to the Jew first and then to the Greek. So he goes to the synagogue. He preaches for three months in the synagogue of the Jews. And the, they like him in the synagogue here in Ephesus, um, at least for three months. <laughs> and then... And then their hearts get hard and uh, there's no more fruit. So he goes to the Gentiles and he goes to the school of Tyrannus. And we learned about that school of Tyrannus. It was a secular place. Uh, it taught daily, uh, daily Bible study for two years in the school of Tyrannus. And great fruit came from that daily Bible study. We saw that the churches of Asia were established because of that daily Bible study in the school of Tyrannus. And so we, we see that there's nine cities in Asia, um, and we know that there were house churches inside each one of those cities. And we went through that as we were starting uh, Acts chapter 19. So now what we see is that there's great fruit being happened in this third missionary journey to the point that, remember, three times Luke tells us in chapter 19 that the word of the Lord is being magnified throughout all of Asia. Remember Acts chapter 19, verse 10, he says, now all this continued, they were in school of Tyrannus for two years, and this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So praise God, the churches of Asia are being established here. And remember, he, he's not a establishing these churches by himself. He's teaching a daily Bible study and there's disciples coming out of that daily Bible study and they're the ones going out and planting these house churches. So a little bit of a different style that we see Paul usually do. So anyway, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Then God is working powerfully through him and unusual miracles are happening by the hands of Paul. That goes from 11 through 20 through verse 20. And two times Luke tells us in verse 17, he tells us that this became known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and the fear of them, the fear of the Lord fell upon all them and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And then in verse 20, we see the same thing after they're burning all those books of magic. And it says, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So what Luke is doing is he's telling us that as Paul has been here, now up till verse 20, he's been there for two years and three months, and all of Asia is hearing the word of the Lord, hearing the name of Jesus, and great things are happening because of that, and there's great fruit coming. But we also know there's great persecution. I mean, you come over here to Acts chapter 20, and he says that for three years, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. He was in Ephesus for three years, and there was many plotting, of, plotting and tears and trials by these unbelieving Jews. So that's the majority of what we see happening as he goes everywhere, as he's preaching the gospel and unbelieving Jews are coming after him and trying to kill him. Well, here in Acts chapter 19, 
we're going to see something a little bit different where it's the pagan Gentiles are now coming after the apostle Paul and they want to try and kill him. It's a revolt against, against Paul, but we see it's because of some different motives and we're going to get into that. Um, so this now in Acts chapter 19, we're going to go through the rest of the chapter. We're going to go through verses 23 through 41. And so it's more of a narrative. So we're going to get through all these verses, but we're going to see this riot that breaks out in Ephesus. We're going to see the name of the Lord glorified through all this. And we also see, um, that, uh, that the pagans, um, you know, they're, they're finally had enough with Paul because they're stealing money from their pocketbook is basically what we're seeing. And so we're going to get into that a little bit as we go. But I love these narratives. They're so fun. I, I've had such a fun time studying this this week. Um, I've actually learned some really neat things through there that I actually had to make a couple of changes on my chronological outline and move things up a few months because of some things I discovered. So isn't that so wonderful that as we dive into his word and go through it, we can read it so many times and he continues to teach us and 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 we and these things are uh, things that I've studied through the week and I can bring them to you and say, look what I found. Look at these treasures that we have. And I think it's just so fun. So I'm really excited to get into the text. So we've seen that there's great persecution coming against him. And this is going to be a final persecution in Ephesus as he's driven out of the city. So that's what happens in our text today. Now, going back to this map, we see that, and I, I want to kind of cue you into the heart of the Apostle Paul. I think that's what's so fun as we're going through. I want to know what is Paul thinking? What is, what is, how, how is the Spirit working in his life? And what's motivating him to do some things? And so here he's in Ephesus. And we know that whenever he first came to Ephesus, he wrote the previous letter to Corinth. He's had his, his heart on all the, the deep concern for the churches through this whole time. But one church stands out specifically, and it's the church of Corinth over here. And so he, de- he has a lot of dealings with the church of Corinth from Ephesus. So he gets to Ephesus probably within that first three months that he's in the synagogue, and he writes a letter to Corinth. It's called the previous letter we found out. Then we know that uh, as a response to um, uh, tie, uh, as a response to Chloe's letter, uh, whenever Apollos comes back to Ephesus and talks to Paul, delivers Chloe's letter, Paul sits down and writes 1 Corinthians. And so, uh, so then Paul sends 1 Corinthians back over to Corinth. And I believe that... Um, Paul actually wanted Apollos to go back and deliver this letter to uh, 1 Corinthians, but Paul, Apollos says, I can't go back there. You know, he says he was quite unwilling to go back at this time. So there were some things uh, happening in the church of Corinth that we're going to touch on a little bit at the end of this lesson. Um, so anyway, he writes that letter of 1 Corinthians. Well, then uh, uh, Timothy is up in Macedonia because he had delivered the previous letter. He went up to Macedonia. On his way back, he's going back. He passes through Corinth. He comes back to Ephesus and he reports some bad news about the church of Corinth um, uh, back to the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul, he says, uh, he says okay, I've got to go and visit them. So he takes a trip and he goes over to Corinth and that's what's known as the sorrowful visit because it was sorrowful for the Corinthian church, and it was sorrow, sorrowful for him too. It was a very hard visit. They still aren't getting it. So he goes over there. This is all during that two years and three months that we talked about as he's in Ephesus. So then he comes back to Ephesus. He writes what's known as the severe letter. That severe letter, he says, he says in 2 Corinthians that I determined in myself that I would not revisit you in sorrow. He says, I can't come see you again in sorrow. It's too hard for you and for me. So he sends Timothy, Eurastus, and Titus back to Corinth, delivering the severe letter, and it says that Paul stayed in Ephesus for a time. And the reason why I bring you that, because that's everything we've learned up to verse 23 today. So notice verse 21. It says, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in his spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I'd been there, I must also see Rome. So that was his heart's desire. He, he wanted to leave Ephesus actually a year earlier and go through Macedonia, Achaia, back to Jerusalem. And the reason why he's doing this is because he wants to, he's not only edifying the the body of Christ and strengthening the churches, he's also collecting the contribution for the saints and taking it back to Judea. And so a year previous to, to where he wrote, um, he wants to go on these travels. But because of the Corinthian church and they're not 
grasping and they're not changing and, and there's this deep concern for the Corinthian church, it actually changes Paul's whole timeline by about a whole year. And so instead of him going over to Macedonia and, and Achaia, it says in verse 20, 22, it says, so, well, that word is actually day, it's but, but he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. So that kind of gives us the setting for what's happening in Ephesus. He, he's sending uh, Timothy, Erastus, and Titus to Corinth, and then he's going through. Notice it says that he actually stayed in Asia for a time. He didn't just stay in Ephesus. He goes through and he starts going house to house, visiting all the churches in Asia. And we know that from Acts chapter 20. He goes from house to house and he's visiting all the churches and strengthening them. And he's doing this in that time, what I believe to be nine months after he sent Timothy, Erastus, and Titus over to Corinth and eventually up to Macedonia. So that sets the stage because... um, Paul has been traveling now for nine months throughout all these churches of Asia, and now he comes back to Ephesus. And he comes back to Ephesus in May of 56 AD. And, and so May, uh, May uh, I'm sorry, May of 57 AD. And so he's been traveling from September of 56 to May of 57 for nine months. And he comes back to Ephesus. And he comes back to Ephesus at a time when it's the pinnacle point when they're worshiping the goddess Artemis or the goddess Diana. And that's very specific as we know the history of what's going on because he comes back to this town and the whole world of Ephesus has come to Asia to worship this goddess Artemis. And that's where we pick up here in verse 23 is there's a riot in Ephesus and it's because the whole town of Ephesus is now worshiping this goddess of Diana because it's the specific time of the year that they did that. And we'll go on to that a little bit more as we go through. So I wanted to set that backstage because it's interesting to see just what's going on in the heart of Paul. He's sending out all these people as deep concern is for the churches, um, comes back to Ephesus and a riot breaks out. So let's go ahead and read. We're just going to read kind of bigger chunks today. Let's read from verses 23 and let's go to verse 27 and then we'll start talking about this. So in verse 23 of chapter 19, he says, and about that time, Now, this is when he's coming back after that nine months of traveling around uh, Asia. So he says, about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. Now, don't you love how Luke describes Christians back then? The way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him, right? So this is describing Jesus Christ and those who follow him. It's the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation, and he said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not, that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people." Man, what an amazing thing. What an amazing testimony here that the the enemy is actually saying this Paul and his travel companions has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. So here you can see Demetrius is upset Not necessarily because he's preaching the gospel, but because the gospel is changing people's hearts and it's affecting his pocketbook. Do you see how this is going? So the unbelieving Jews, they they were jealous in the same way. They they were jealous because the Christians were were robbing their glory. They they wanted all the glory on themselves. But really Christians, it's not that we're robbing glory. It's that we're giving glory to Jesus Christ. And and the Jews didn't like that. Well, the same thing with the pagans in an indirect way. Paul is, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, many people are turning away from their sin of worshiping idols, and it's giving people doubt on whether this great goddess Diana is actually a real god or not, and it's giving them enough doubt that they're not wanting to spend their money on buying these little trinkets made out of silver by Demetrius. So we talked about a little bit about this Artemis uh, whenever he first came into Ephesus. 
This is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, um, Ephesus was the place of worship to worship this goddess. Now, the god it says goddess Diana in your New, New King James. You'll see a little you know, notation. It's Artemis in the Greek. So it's goddess, it's the Diana in Roman, and, and it's the Artemis in Greek. Now, that's not to be confused. There's also another Roman goddess who was named Diana. She was the, the goddess of the hunt. That's not this goddess. This is the goddess Art, Artemis, or the goddess Diana of the Ephesians. And they called it of the Ephesians because they believe that Zeus sent her to the earth from heaven. She fell out of heaven, landed in Ephesus, and this is where she was born. And that's why, and that's why they call it Artemis of the Ephesians. And we actually see that in the text as we come up. So that's, that's where they get their Greek mythology is that it's Artemis of the Ephesians. And so she was born in Ephesus. Now she's the goddess of fertility, the goddess of nutritive power, of nature and things like that. That's why this grotesque, <laughs> absolutely disgusting image that we're seeing here, I debated about even putting it up, but it's so grotesque, you can, you can see why she got kicked out of heaven. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> it's just it's disgusting, you know? But it's this multi-breasted thing, you know, just showing this, uh, you know, she's like the goddess of fertility showing this thing. But, but she's greatly celebrated in Ephesus because they believe that she was born there, that she fell out of heaven from, from Zeus. So also with the goddess of Diana, they, they built a temple to house her in. And it's called the temple of Artemis or the temple of Diana. Now, this temple is massive. It's actually one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Um, it's 425 feet long, 220 feet wide. Uh, it has 127 columns that are made out of solid marble, six foot in diameter. Those, those uh, columns stand 60 feet tall. It's a massive structure dedicated to the goddess Artemis. And, um, and in fact, it's actually four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens. So it's a massive temple, uh, which was... Uh, it was, celebrating, it was celebrating goddess Diana. Now, Connie Bear, which is a scholar I like to read, he actually wrote the life of Paul. He writes this about this temple. He says, no other temple consecrated a greater amount of admiration, enthusiasm, and superstition than this temple of Artemis. So it was a major place where people came to worship the goddess Artemis. And it, and it was only, this temple was only in Ephesus. There were other places around the world. In fact, 39 places where they, would, they could go and worship the goddess Artemis. Artemis, but in Ephesus was the magnificent place because this is where they believe that she was born. Now, in addition to the great temple, Ephesus also dedicated an, an entire month to the celebration of this goddess. And it was called the Artemisian Festival. And so it was, a, it was an entire month of festivities dedicated to worshiping this goddess. This is the same month, scholars agree, that Paul came into Ephesus after traveling around nine months, comes back. And that's why there's such an uproar about the goddess Diana here is because this is a festival dedicated to the goddess of Art, Artemis and the silversmiths are expecting to cash in and make a lot of money here. But yet now Paul's been traveling around telling all of Asia that the word of the Lord, turn away from your sin and trust in the true living God, right? He's been saying that. And now they're doubting and they're not buying. They're still coming to Ephesus. You know, you can tell they're not Christians yet, but they're doubting whether or not they should be buying these things because Paul has been, has been telling them that these gods aren't real. And his word has been validated by powerful miracles, signs and wonders, right? So people in Ephesus are, you know, I just read those three verses that all who dwelt in Asia heard, heard the word of the Lord and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. You know, the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed in all of Asia. So people are not buying these little trinkets anymore because they they don't think that, you know, they think, well, maybe Paul's right. We don't want to spend our money on this. So this is now what's happening in, in Ephesus when he comes there. Also on on top of that, we, on top of the Artemisian festival that's happening in May, they also had what was called the Ephesian Games, much like the Olympics, but it was held in Ephesus. And so if you look at a map of Ephesus back in the first century, you'll actually see a stadium and that's where they held the Ephesian Games too. So it was a great time of celebration for these pagans with the festival of Artemis and the Ephesian Games and the, um, and the silversmiths are trying to make money at it. 
So this gives an opportunity for this Artemis, or for, uh, Di, um, uh, for Demetrius to be selling these little trinkets. But just like I said, he's been traveling around. In fact, Acts chapter 19, verse 26, I don't know if you caught that. Let's just read that again. It says, moreover, you see and hear that not only at Asia, at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So you can see that's the word of the Lord that Paul is speaking, that these, these these little statues aren't really statues at all. So the truth is spreading. So Demetrius takes his guys together as workers. I picture Demetrius as like the head of the silversmith union and, and, and all things Artemis, right? I mean, that's kind of the picture I get with this guy, Demetrius. And he's in the marketplace in Ephesus and he calls his workers together. He sees his sales are way down where they should be. And he, it says in verse 25, he calls them together with the workers of similar occupation. That similar occupation, uh, it's interesting because we find that archaeologists have found that not only are they, was there silver idols made of this goddess, but there was also terracotta uh, idols made. And so, and those terracotta idols are actually still around quite a bit today because the silver ones, evidently they, they melted down and turned them to something else. The terracotta ones, they're finding those quite regularly and they're of that grotesque multi-breasted goddess, you know? And so similar occupation would mean probably these terracotta makers, the silversmiths. And I would conjecture that it's, you think about what happened with the burning of the magic books and the spells. Those, they were buying those too. Because remember Luke said that 50,000 pieces of silver worth were, were uh, burned. He makes that comment because again, it's affecting the pagan's pocketbook. No longer are they buying these magic spells and books and, and idols and those types of things. So since Paul's come to town, it's been a real struggle for the, <laughs> for the pagans to make some money. Praise God for that, right? All of Asia is turning away. You know, I just love how in Acts chapter 20, uh, whenever he's talking about what he did in Asia, let me just read it over here. He says that in verse 20, he's talking about what he did for these three years, how he kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God, turn away from your useless idols and turn upon the living God. That's what he, that's what he was preaching in Athens. That's what he's preaching in Ephesus here. So this is why their sales have gone down. Now in verse 26, notice how emphatic Demetrius is uh, against Paul. It says, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but also throughout all of Asia, this Paul has turned and, and persuaded to many people to turn away. This Paul, this Paul is doing some major work and we don't like it. You know, God validated his apostle and he validated his word through signs, wonders, and miracles, right? We read that with the handkerchiefs and those types of things happening. So we know that these guys are seeing the apostle Paul and God work through the apostle Paul in so much that you see, notice these words, moreover, you see and hear. This word see is actually uh, theaomai, which doesn't mean just to see. They are in amazement. This is, you are looking and you are beholding this, uh, these amazing things that the apostle Paul is doing and they can't explain it. So he says, you've seen and you've heard. <laughs> yes, we know Paul is doing some amazing things or we know God is working through Paul doing some amazing things. The pagans are seeing this and it's undeniable. They know that something miraculous is happening and yet, but yet they, they are so hard hearted here. They want their money more than they want the truth, right? It reminds me of, remember whenever Jesus cast out the demons in the madman of Gadara and he cast those pigs, it cast the demons into the pigs and the pigs uh, ran into the sea. And remember the people in that land, they kicked Jesus out because he just ruined all their profit on that swine. You know, they chose profit over Jesus. That's what these guys are doing. They're choosing profit over, uh, over the truth. And so they're, they say, he says, moreover, you see and hear that all these things are happening. So now looking at this, I like this rendering. I've looked at a lot of maps of ancient Ephesus. I kind of like this one. It gives you a perspective. Here's the bay you know, as they, as you come into Ephesus, the major harbor there, um, this is the theater as we're seeing in this surround. We're going to talk about that a lot. This is the theater that's actually still there in ruins. Um, but there's this major, you know, uh, 
thoroughfare going in from the bay. And you can see it comes right into the theater. Then also there's this Agora Marketplace. Much like in Athens, there was an Agora Marketplace in Athens. We see the same thing right here. This is where they, they did their trading. And, and this is where Demetrius would have, would have set up and was selling his goods. But notice that they are, there's an, uh, an easy avenue into the theater from this Agora Marketplace. So that's where this is taking place. Demetrius is in this marketplace and he's stirring up the workers. And, uh, and you can picture him pointing right over here. Uh, you can't see it in this drawing, but kind of back to my right over there, you see, or I guess it's back over in this area. Um, that's where the temple Artemis actually stood. So you could see it from the harbor. You could see it from the marketplace. You could see it back in the distance. So you can picture Demetrius pointing to that temple saying, you know, he, he's disgracing our temple Diana. Um, but also we find that Gaius and Aristarchus are also within this marketplace. He's, he's picking out Paul, but you know he's, he's pointing to the people who are working with Paul. So that kind of gives you a perspective on where he's doing this and where he's talking. Now there's three reasons in verse 27 that he's using to guilt the workers into causing a riot. The first one is what he says in the first verse or first part. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, you know, they're, they're stealing our money because they're, they're preaching this, that these, these idols are not really idols, not really gods make, made with human hands. So he goes, that's the real motive here. He's, he's losing money. But then he uses two other motives to guilt them into causing a riot. So notice this. The second one is, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana or Artemis may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. All the world and all of Asia is coming to Ephesus on this great day of, of May so that we can worship the goddess Diana and we're expecting to make a lot of money and, and he, they're destroying her magnificence. So you can see the last two are more of a guilt and the first one is the real motive. You know, So you can see what Demetrius is doing. So we don't even know if Demetrius was even a true worshiper of the great goddess Diana. I, I, it's hard to even say. He just was concerned about making money, right? He's a silversmith. And so he's in, so this is what he goes in. And so that you can see the results of it. Verses 28 and 29. Let's just read that. He says, now when they heard this, now that they is the workers who Demetrius is talking about, talking to, he says, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now, because of their uproar, notice it gets the crowd going. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. So that's what's, so notice what's happening. They're back in this, they're in this Agora marketplace here, just below the theater. He starts stirring up the workers. The workers start chanting, great is Diana of the Ephesians. The whole city is full of people who have come to worship this goddess. And now they're hearing what's going on, but they don't quite have the whole story. They're in confusion, but there's a, there's a riot breaking out. And, and now it overfloods this marketplace. And so they start pouring into the theater because it's just right there. So it starts getting giving us an idea of what's happening. Now, Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's travel companions, happened to be right there. And the workers evidently knew that they were, he was, they were working with Paul. So they grab him and they rush into the theater. And now they start, you know, creating a mob. So now we're looking at, at, a, at not only just a riot, it's turning into a, a mob, a violent mob. And they don't even know why they're there. That's the interesting thing is, you know, they, he stirred up the crowd and it's kind of gotten out of control. Now, a couple things, whenever we see, especially in Paul's letters and in the book of Acts, when we see names of fellow workers, I love taking a minute and just seeing who these people are. Because sometimes you find some real gems in there that are just fun seeing how the network of the gospel is spreading and how Paul is using these disciples. So this Gaius, um, we don't know much about him. There's actually uh, three Gaiuses, four if you think about it, four Gaiuses in the New Testament. And I, I don't believe that they're all the same Gaius. Um, Gaius was a pretty common name back then. We know here they're specifically Macedonians. There's also another Gaius that's mentioned in Acts chapter 20, verse four of Gaius of Derby. 
But Derby was in Galatia. It wasn't in Macedonia. So that can't be the same guys. It's another guy. <laughs> another guy. <is. laughs> and so uh, anyway, uh, so then we have um, Gaius of Corinth. <laughs> uh, so Gaius of Corinth, he's also mentioned, um, but that's not the same guys because he's Gaius of Corinth. So we have Gaius of Macedonia, Gaius of Derby, Gaius of Corinth. Um, so, and then also we see Gaius in 3 John, which some scholars say that that may be the same person because Gaius in 3 John was possibly in Ephesus. This Gaius was in Ephesus at this time. I don't, I think there's too much of a span there. There's like 40 years in between. So it's very possible. We, we don't really know much about Gaius, but we know actually a little bit more about Aristarchus, which I think is very fascinating here. Aristarchus, he is the, a Macedonian and he is the Macedonian from Thessalonica. We see that specifically if you look over at verse, uh, let's see, let's go to chapter 20. And he's listing out some people that are coming with him. Verse four, it says, Sopater of Berea accompanied him with, uh, to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby. So there is Aristarchus of the Thessalonians. And we know that he's now traveling with the Apostle Paul. Now, notice something here. It's, the, it's Paul's travel companions. Flip over with me to Acts chapter 27, verse 2. Notice this. Acts 27 you flash forward, this is now after Paul has made his appeal to Caesar and he's arrested and he's getting on a boat and being shipped over to Rome. Now notice who's with him. Let's just look at verse 1, 27, 1. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So Luke is with Paul. They're getting ready to go on a boat to go to Rome because Paul is a prisoner. And it says in verse 2, so entering a ship uh, of Adramatium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia, Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. So Aristarchus is with the apostle Paul as he's getting on this ship to go to Rome and Paul is a prisoner. And I would conjecture that Aristarchus is a prisoner with Paul going over to Rome because now flip over to Colossians, we see Aristarchus mentioned again in Colossians. So look at Colossians chapter four. And this is a very interesting thing uh, uh, that I was looking at. It just gives us a little bit about Aristarchus. Colossians chapter 4, and look at verse 10. It says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. Aristarchus, so Paul is writing the book of Colossians, the letter of Colossians, uh, from prison in Rome. And he's writing it back to the church in Asia in Colossae. And Aristarchus, we know, was getting on the boat to go to Rome with Paul. And now Paul is saying, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greet you. Aristarchus was a prisoner in Rome with the apostle Paul. Isn't that fun to see? I, I love seeing those connections there that we see that Paul, that Aristarchus was, was a major travel companion with the Apostle Paul in so much that he actually got arrested with the Apostle Paul. And also one thing, whenever we get to the book of Hebrews, we'll find that Timothy was also arrested in Jerusalem and he was in prison, I believe in Caesarea for a couple of years as well. So we see Timothy, Erastus, and of course, Paul, these, these men of God getting arrested and, and you know, being fellow prisoners with, uh, with Paul in the gospel. So just some fun things about these guys. So I like, I like taking a minute and seeing who are these people that Paul is mentioning because they're deep brethren and, and beloved brethren of Paul. So now look at verse 30 through 32. Notice what happens here. I love the heart of Paul. So his, his fellow travel companions, Gaius and Aristarchus, they get dragged into the theater. Now we pick it up in verse 30. And he says, and when Paul wanted to go into the people, I love that. He wants to go in and, and help his, his, bre, his beloved brethren. When Paul wants to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. So again, you stop and think, the disciples, who is with the apostle Paul right now? I like to just think about that. Well, we know Timothy, Erastus, and Titus, they're not there because they're up in Macedonia and Troas. Gaius and Aristarchus are, are in the theater. So the people that are left that we know were with him, and I'm sure there was more, but the people specifically we know is Tychicus, Trophimus, Apollos 
and Aquila and Priscilla. They're, they're probably the disciples that are holding Paul back saying, no, don't go into that theater. You're going to get yourself killed, you know? But I love the apostle Paul. I love what he, uh, just his heart. So, so these are the disciples that I believe are probably there telling him to do that. Then it goes into, um, so it says, they, uh, verse 30, and when Paul wanted to go into the, pl- into the people, uh, the disciples would not allow him. Then, verse 31, some of the, the officials of Asia who were, with, who were his friends sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not even know why they had come together. So that's typical mob mentality right there. I mean, now you got thousands of people pouring into this theater. This is a picture of what uh, the theater looks like today. It's, it's in ruins, but it's still there. Um, scholars say that it could hold up to 25,000 people in its day. Some people even say more, but for sure 25,000 people. You can see this is that, um, that area with that big wall, and just below that would have been the Agora Marketplace. So this is that theater that they're all rushing into. Um, and notice here, this is the second time that that, uh, Luke says that the mob was confused. In verse 32, it says they're confused. In verse 29, remember it says the whole city was filled with confusion and they rushed into the theater. So twice, Luke tells us that these people are very confused. They don't even know why they've gathered. They're just, they hear people chanting, great is the goddess of Ephesus. And they're they're just, that's how a mob uh, happens. So the city is full of this. Again, you have to remember, this is the Artemisian festival, and this is why they've come, is to worship the goddess Diana. And I love Paul. He, he's trying to go in, but his disciples wouldn't let him. And I, I think about something that's going to happen very soon as we get to Acts chapter 21. Again, there's prophecy saying that, that Paul was going to get arrested and even probably killed in Jerusalem. And remember, his disciples wouldn't allow him or wouldn't let him go to Jerusalem. But I love Paul's words. It says in verse 20, chapter 21, verse 12, notice what he says. Now, when we heard these things, when, when we, Luke is talking, and when the disciples heard that um, there was Jews at Jerusalem that were going to be arresting Paul. Now, when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem and listen to Paul's response. I can just picture them, him saying the same exact thing in the theater right here. (laughs) He says, then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. That was the apostle Paul's heart. I mean, he didn't care. He was going to rush into this theater, you know, if it be the Lord's will. And he's even willing to give his life for that. But of course, it wasn't his time. His, the disciples hold him back and they tell him, don't go in. But notice that there's also some other people there that aren't letting him in, that don't want him to go into this theater. And it's these officials of Asia. It says, then some of the officials of Asia who were, with, who were his friends sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. So we have the disciples telling him not to go, and you also have these officials of Asia. Now, whenever you look at this officials of Asia, it's this... um, uh, this word ACR case or ACRCH. Um, it's one word in the Greek. It means, you know, uh, a chief of Asia or an official of Asia is a good, good translation. But as you study in, in history of who these ACRCHs actually are, there are some pretty high ranking people, but they're not of the government. They're not Roman government. They're not of the government. They're high ranking wealthy citizens of Asia. And what these people are is they were brought in specifically for the games so that they could preside over the Ephesian games and over the festival of Artemis. And they would do this kind of displaying their, their richness and their pomp and their charm. They would come in and they, would, um, they were elected separately, se- celebrity people that would come in and promote the festival. And it was a way of, of Ephesus kind of bringing in high level people to kind of promote the city, to bring in pomp and charm and wealth and prestige to the city. So it's an interesting tactic that they're doing because the pagans, they love the rich and the wealthy, right? And the, the, these, be, these people, they said that I think up to 10 Asiarchs were here during the month of May. But what's interesting is you know, these, these people, they're probably not Christians. They're, they're, they, they loved going to these things because it was all about boasting about themselves. Everybody had the attention on them. They were boasting about their charm and pomp. But it's interesting that Luke specifically mentions that they were friends of the Apostle Paul, right? 
So these guys, this just tells us the favor that God was giving Paul, that these high level, high ranking officials in Ephesus, they actually liked Paul and they're telling him, don't go in there because you're going to die. Now, also, they didn't want blood spilled on this great event, you know, so they probably are saving that, but they, they, they truly have a relationship with Paul. And so it tells us that there's this open door in Ephesus. Remember in 1 Corinthians 16, uh, it tells us that there's an open door in Ephesus. And he says, he says, and I have many adversaries, but I'm going to stay here for a few months until Pentecost because there's this open door. I believe this favor with the Roman government, the favor with these Asiarchs, the favor with the people, and the favor with the school of Tyrannus, all these things are the open door for Paul as he's going in. We saw that same favor with, um, uh, with Paul whenever he was over in Corinth. Remember with the Gallio, the proconsul in Gallio. It, remember, he stood up and he defended the apostle Paul against the unbelieving Jews and allowed Paul to stay there for a year and a half. So we see constantly through the book of Acts, we see favor with the leaders as, as uh, granting Paul some time in these cities. Also, one thing to mention, you also have to have in the back of your mind as you're reading through the book of Acts, what is the main reason why Luke is writing this book? We know it's the Holy Spirit prompting um, Luke to write this so we can sit here today and be led of the Spirit and understand the forming of the early church. But, but the logistical reasons is, is Luke is writing these as trial documents for the Apostle Paul because he made an appeal to Caesar and he's writing to Theophilus, who I believe is a Roman official. And it's interesting, every time you read about the government and Rome and things like that with riots and stuff, Paul and Christianity is never the problem. It's always either the unbelieving Jews or, or Demetrius in this case. And, and uh, Rome is always portrayed as the good guys, always keeping law and order, always making sure they're, they're keeping things set. And it just shows that that's why he's writing this letter as trial documents, because he's, this is an appeal to Caesar. So kind of interesting when you think about that in the background. So it makes sense why he's spending some time. Now we're going to find as we go into the latter chapters, um, Luke is going to spend like the, the last eight chapters of Acts all about Roman law and, and Paul getting up and speaking in front of Festus and Felix and King Herod and those things. And it's because um, it, it's trial documents. He's showing and making a case that, that Christianity is not hostile to the Roman government. That's what he's making. And, and he's also in, the, in that same way, he's saying that Jesus is savior of the world, repent and turn to Jesus. And, and here's the salvation that has come to the whole world. That's why he's writing this book of Acts, but it's all stemming from this, these trial documents. So there's kind of fun is you're putting all these things together. So now we get into verses 33 and 34. And you have to remember, you know, Paul's main persecutions was coming from the Jews, right? We talked about that. We see a lot of that in the book of Acts, where these unbelieving Jews are constantly coming against him. Here we see that, um, that here's one of the rare occasions where pagans are rising up and it's because it's affecting their pocketbook. So, um, but I make that mention because here in these two verses, we're going to see that the Jews are desperately wanting to make a separation from Christianity. They're wanting the Roman government and they're wanting these pagans to know that they have nothing to do with Christianity. Because from a pagan per per perspective, they saw Christianity as just another sect of Judaism. But um, the Jews were like, no, I don't want, we don't want anything to do with Christianity. And I think that's why we see these next two verses. Let's look at verses 33 and 34. He says, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. So that's why they're doing this. They're, they're putting a spokesperson forward and Alexander, that's the spokesperson, motioned with his hand and wanting to make his defense to the people. So he's saying, this is now the Jews in an effort to say, we're separate from these Christians. Don't attack us. We have nothing to do with this. Worship whoever you want. You can do whatever you want. We're, we're fine with it. You know, that's, you can just picture the unbelieving Jews saying, they have no allegiance. And it's, they, don't, they say they believe in God, but they don't, they don't truly even believe in God. You can see they're, um, you know, they're unbelievers. And so they're, they're, they're wanting to make a separation from, from Christianity so much that they're actually siding with the pagans. It's kind of interesting. You, you talk about compromise. So anyway, you go down to verse 33 and they, they drew Alexander over the multitude or out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanting to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. 
So when they found out that Alexander was a Jew, in the pagan's mind, Jews and Christians are the same, and they just disregard him, and they keep crying out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now, what's interesting about this guy, Alexander, that again, I just kind of want to put a connecting point. It's hard to say if this is real. It's kind of fun to think if it was real, that is this the same Alexander the coppersmith that we see in First and Second Timothy? Because here we have Alexander. He's in Ephesus. He's a Jew, but he despises the Christians. And remember, uh, Demetrius is, is a silversmith and he's talking to other silversmiths and others of similar trade. Alexander was a coppersmith. Was it possible that Alexander, this is the same Alexander the coppersmith who was in Ephesus and is now, uh, uh, you know, because in First and Second Timothy, it was written to Ephesus, to the church of Ephesus. That's where uh, Timothy was bishop of Ephesus. So you start putting that link together. In fact, just turn over with me to 1 Timothy because it's kind of fun to see this connection here. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. And we can see maybe a motive on why Alexander is getting up in front of everybody and why he's even willing to talk. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 20. He says, actually back up to verse 19. He says, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwrecked. So whoever he's about ready to mention, Alexander, namely, is one that has rejected the faith. Verse 20, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may, not learn, that they may learn not to blaspheme. That Alexander, we find, if you go over to 2 Timothy chapter 4, we find that Alexander the coppersmith did Paul great harm. And so Alexander from 1 Timothy 1 and Alexander the coppersmith from 2 Timothy 4 are the same Alexander, and he did much harm to the apostle Paul, and it's because he despised Paul and despised Christianity because he rejected the faith, and of course Paul had to remove him. And so is it possible that this Alexander who the Jews drew out, is it the same one because Alexander is despising the Christians and they know that they can put him forward and he'll talk bad about the apostle Paul? It's a possibility, right? Just a fun conjecture, seeing the, the similarities. They both were from Ephesus. They both were metal workers and they, they both despised the apostle Paul. So very, very possible that that's the same person. So now in verse 34, we see that it says they, they were, they, they found, uh, but when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice, they cried out. And in the Greek, it says, a voice became one out from all. A voice became one out from the whole multitude of that theater of, of tens of thousands of people. And they're chanting, great is the, is Diana or Artemis of the Ephesians. And, um, and, and they're doing this for two hours. I mean, unrelenting. And they don't even know why they're doing it. You know, it's just, it's so crazy to see the confusion that's going on. So Alexander, the, Alexander, um, the coppersmith, he can't quiet the crowd. And there are a few who could. But what's interesting is we find one man gets up and he does quiet the crowd. And it's, it's a, what seems like an unassuming person gets it. And I have, I have wondered until this week, I have wondered well, how could a city clerk quiet this crowd in Ephesus, this mob that's out of control? So well, we, we find the answer, and this is what I'm excited to share with you. So verse 35, let's just read 35 through 40. So this guy gets up, and when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, you know, it may, who, who is the city clerk? How can a town clerk in the King James, how can a town clerk quiet this, this violent mob? And he said, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? He says, everybody in the world, everybody in, in Asia knows that the great goddess Diana, Artemis, came down from heaven from Zeus. She's, she's our goddess and, we, and, and everybody comes to Ephesus to worship her. Verse 36, therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemer, blasphemers of your goddess. See, there's the, there's the, the officials saying that Christianity is, isn't isn't something bad. They're not hostile to Rome or they're, they're not hostile. They're not, they're not rule breakers. They're not even blaspheming your idols. What Paul was saying is he was saying, repent from these uh, useless idols and turn to the living God. But he wasn't, you know, he wasn't blaspheming. He was just 
preaching the truth and preaching Jesus Christ. So he goes on, verse, uh, um, verse 38. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the, in the lawful assembly. Now, notice that Deme this guy, um, he has all the facts. He's a pretty smart guy. The, the whole assembly, the whole crowd is confused. They don't know why they're there. This town clerk knows what's going on. He's calling out Demetrius as, as being the one that's stirring it up. He knows that Paul, and he knows his, that he's been preaching and not blaspheming, and he hasn't been breaking any rules. So this guy, while they're chanting, great is the goddess Diana, he's obviously done his homework, and so he comes up calm, cool, and collected, and he is being in authority telling these guys um, that they shouldn't be doing this. So then it goes into verse 40. For we are in danger of being called into question for today's uproar there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. So he says, we got to knock it off. We, we're in a free city of Ephesus. That's what Ephesus was. It was a free city. We, we can't be acting like this or else the Roman government is going to come in and take our freedom away. We, and it was his, it was his uh, responsibility, among others, to make sure that the town stayed in order. So uh, this, this city clerk, obviously he's more than just a recorder. This, this city clerk, it's the Greek word grammatus. Now, in, uh, whenever you have this word grammatus uh, in reference to a Jew, it's a scribe. In, for pagans from history, we find out that a grammatus is somebody of very high-ranking authority, a magistrate who had all the dealings with the letters and the correspondence of the city. He had the, he had the, um, it was the power of what you would call maybe the media, you know, and what we know today. This guy knew the dealings, the happenings that were happening in the, in the city. And so he was a major guy. In, in fact, Martin Luther translated this word grammatus as chancellor. And so in in the, in the German Bible, it's actually translated chancellor. So he is a chancellor, a magistrate of great authority, knowing the ins and outs and everything and controlling the city in that position. So that's why he can control the crowd because they looked at him uh, as one with great authority. Now, here's some archaeological evidence to kind of help support that. There's archaeological evidence uh, finding this coin that actually has this inscription of Cusaneus of Ephesus. Now, we don't know, we don't know if Cusaneus uh, was the grammatus of Ephesus during this exact time, but it was definitely during the first century. And notice this Cusianus. In history, it tells us that Cusianus was a grammatus of Ephesus. And he was of such high caliber that they made a coin after him. So that tells us this isn't just some city clerk, you know, stuck behind a desk. This is a major man of high authority to the point that they would print a coin, an image of him on a coin. And so this guy, I mean, th this guy had some major pull. And so the mob is listening to him and we see that the mob listens to him. They don't put him aside just like they did with Alexander. And what's so fun too, is he, as you go through the book of Acts, we're constantly seeing where Luke is so exact with his terminology, you know, grammatus and proconsuls and procurators and, you know, magistrates and those types of things. And they're always checking out with archaeological evidence, right? And so here's just another instance that the Bible is completely infallible and it is right in line with exactly what, the, what Luke is writing in the book of Acts. So I think that's really fun to bring up. Now, Ephesus, like I said, was a free city. And so they could rule it of their own accord, but they had to make sure that they maintained order. If they didn't maintain order, it got brought to, their, to Rome's attention and there would be, um, there would be consequence, consequences to, uh, to pay. So they were in danger of, of um, being called into question for today's uproar because they didn't have any reason for this disorderly gathering. And he says, we have places to gather. We have lawful assemblies. We have proconsuls. We, people, we can go down into those places and you can meet and we can make sure that we work this stuff out. Don't be doing it. So you know he's talking right to Demetrius and those workers that are stirring things up. So again, Luke, with this whole thing, is alluding to the favor of Rome, right? He, he constantly is, is alluding and telling us that, that, you know, Paul and his travel companions, Christians, we don't, we're not hostile to the government. We're only hostile or we only seem like we're hostile because we stand for truth. 
and, and so the pagans and the world will call us hostile, but we truly aren't. We're just proclaiming that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Repent, turn away from your useless idols, turn away from your useless things, and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? But of course, sometimes the world doesn't like that. Uh, so now we go into the last verse, verse 41. And notice what he says. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So that shows the power of this town clerk, of this grammatus, this high official, that the threat of the strong arm of Rome and this guy in major authority, um, they listened to him and the crowd dispersed. So Paul, he leaves the city at this point. This is now his, his time to leave. He wanted to leave a year ago, but the spirit wasn't you know, having that. He knew he had to stay a little bit longer and he was being led of the spirit. Now it's time the spirit is leading him out of Ephesus and he's going on about his way. But this wasn't the end of Ephesus. By far, uh, the the, uh, church of Ephesus, if you remember, uh, Paul was making the church of Ephesus the center hub of Christianity during this time. So we see from this point on, Timothy becomes the bishop of Ephesus. We see John, the apostle John, moves to Ephesus later on in his life. We see guys like Polycarp come in and the great men of God that are from from, uh, Asia, Smyrna right there. So anyway, the, the, the churches of Asia became a major central hub for Christianity. Um, so even though Paul's leaving, um, he's not, uh, you know, he's not forsaking them, obviously. Now that ends chapter 19. Now I, I just want to read one verse from chapter 20 because it, it ends his time in Ephesus and it moves on to the next stage of his journey. So notice what he says in verse one of chapter 20. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself. He embraced them and departed to go to Macedonia. So you remember, this is, what, this is what he wanted to do a year ago. He wanted to go to Macedonia, then Achaia, then to Jerusalem, then to Rome, right? He's going to do that, but it's not by how he thought he was going to be traveling, right? He, he, this is a year later. Now he's going to be going to Macedonia and then to Achaia. But we also know that he told us whenever he wrote his second letter of Corinthians, he said, I, I can't come to you in sorrow again. I'm not going to come to you. I've... I've I've ordered it in my in myself that I am not going to come to you in sorrow. So he heads up to Macedonia, but he wants to go to Corinth, but he says, I, I, I can't until I know that you guys are, are getting on, on board with the truth. So as we read through the book of Acts, we find that when he goes to Macedonia, it's in Macedonia that he writes 2 Corinthians. And so next week, we're going to be doing an overview of 2 Corinthians because this is where uh, he writes that book. But we find in the book of 2 Corinthians, and just turn over there for a second. Um, in 2 Corinthians, go to, chapter, uh, go to chapter 2. And we find that in chapter 2, verse 12, he makes a pit stop before he goes to Macedonia because he's looking for one person. He's looking for Titus. And we find that in verse 12 of chapter 2. So notice 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. He says, furthermore, when I came to Troas, this is after leaving Ephesus, he came there to preach, the, uh, preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. So there, after he leaves Ephesus, he goes to Troas. He's trying to find his brother Titus because he had sent, Titus had sent the severe letter to them in Corinth. And then evidently they told him, meet me in Troas and I'll meet you there. He comes to, he comes to Troas. He can't find him. There's an open door in Troas. What's interesting about that is remember what else happened in Troas. That's where he picked up brother Luke. Luke was in Troas, but remember there was no talk of conversions in Troas. Now, finally, there's an open door, but Paul is searching for Titus and he had no rest in his spirit. So he goes on and he goes up to Macedonia. So if you look at this map, you've got Ephesus. And so he wanted to go over to Corinth, but he couldn't because he says, I've, I've, I've uh, established it in my heart. I'm not going to go to you guys in sorrow. So instead he goes up by land and he comes to Troas right there. Can't find Titus. So then he comes over into Macedonia, probably stopping at Philippi to say hi to his brother Luke. And then, you know, of course, he probably came over to to, uh, Thessalonica as well. So it's in either Thessalonia or Philippi that he writes 2 Corinthians. Now he gets to Macedonia and he finds Timothy and Erastus. They're there because he sent him up there, right? But who else comes but Titus. Titus finally joins him over in, in, uh, in, 
um, Macedonia. And if you just glance over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, notice what he says here. Chapter 7, verse 5. He says this, for indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside we were, con- were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast comfort us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was conformed in you, comforted in you, when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. Finally is a good report about the Corinthian church. Finally. So now, remember he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, actually verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, but I determined within myself that I would not come again to you in sorrow. So, but now he, he's going to come to Corinth and he's not going to be in sorrow because he's got this good report from Titus who has met him up in Macedonia. Now he says, now they're accepting it. Now they've, they've read your letter. They read your severe letter. They're finally getting it. They're rebuked. They're convicted. They're turning to the living God and they're, they're stopping their pridefulness. They're stopping their bickering. You know, they're there's, there's, um, there's some things, some people are still talking bad about you, and we're going to talk about that in 2 Corinthians. But overall, they're still, they're, they're coming around. So Paul determines within himself that now he's in Macedonia. Now he can go on with what he wants to do. And after he's in Macedonia and he writes 2 Corinthians, he sends that, down, that letter down to Corinth uh, with Titus. Titus delivers that. Then a few months later, Paul and company comes down to Corinth. And we see that if you go back to Acts chapter chapter 19 or chapter 20, look at verse three. He says in verse three, actually look at verse two, sorry. In verse two, now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed there three months. And so now, so he goes to Macedonia, he writes 2 Corinthians, then he comes down to Greece, namely Corinth, and that's whenever he's going to write the book of Romans. And so we see all this coming together as he's doing this. But I want to bring you back to something that he said in verse 1 of chapter 20, when it says, after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself and embraced them and departed to Macedonia. I love that picture because here he's in Ephesus, And he doesn't know if he's going to ever see these people in Ephesus again. So he calls them together and he embraces them. And they, and I'm sure there were tears because, you know, he knew that he was bound to go to Jerusalem. The spirit told him that wherever he goes, chains and tribulations await me, right? He knows, we just read that earlier on, that whenever he goes to Jerusalem, he might even die when he goes to Jerusalem. So he's leaving Ephesus knowing that he's going to collect the collection for the saints and he's going to go to Jerusalem and he might die in there. So this is quite possibly in his mind, the last time he's going to see his brethren that he's been there for three years with these people. Now we know that after after he gets done with Corinth on his third missionary journey, he comes over to Miletus, which is just on the, uh, you know, on the outskirts of Ephesus, talks to the leaders of Ephesus, but the people in Ephesus, the brothers and sisters there at the church, he doesn't know if he's ever going to see them again. Kind of, I like showing you that because you can just see the heart of the apostle Paul, the deep concern for the churches, but the onward motion to preach the gospel and to bring this contribution to Ju- uh, Jerusalem and then eventually go to Rome and spread the gospel to Rome. That's his mission, right? So for your homework, we are going to be studying 2 Corinthians next week. And like I've done in the past with Galatians and First and 2 Thessalonians, and we've done 1 Corinthians. Now we're going to do 2 Corinthians. We're going to look at all the chapters in 2 Corinthians in one lesson. So we're going to just going to kind of clip through it. So I would encourage you to read it during the course of this next week. It's a wonderful epistle. You can see now, just read it with the mindset of now they've actually come along. They aren't you know, they aren't rebuking Paul anymore. They're not in this, this wild bunch. They seem like they're settling down and there's this good report from Titus. Read it with that mindset and see what, how Paul changes, how, how he's different in his second letter versus his first letter. Kind of interesting when you know the background. So if you can read those, those chapters for next week, and then we'll take that overview uh, next week. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up with prayer then. All right. Thank you, Father, for this word of truth. We thank you for, see, for showing us these um, examples of how your great men of Paul and Gaius and Aristarchus, Timothy, Erastus, Titus, all these great men that we gave their lives for the gospel. Thank you, Father, that, that we can see their heart, that they were 
telling people to repent, turn away from these useless idols and turn to the one true God, no matter the consequence, but to trust in you. So Father, we do that. We trust in you. No matter what's going on in, in our lives, we turn away from our things that, that are dishonoring to you and we turn upon the living God. We trust in you, Father. Thank you for being our provider. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for giving us the boldness and the, and the encouragement to gather together with our brothers and sisters, even to the point of being arrested and and having these persecutions, but we gather together and help each other. So we thank you for showing us the Apostle Paul's heart through this, that we can stand strong by these witnesses that your word tells us to do. I bless my brothers and sisters as they, they go about this next week to be strengthened in your word, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord and risen from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen.